how we got started was I've got a, a partner who does a lot of trade shows and uh, you know county fairs and things like that. And he was complaining to us one time, me and a, another friend. He said, you know, I've got all these storage sheds. I'm paying a fortune in storage sheds. I, and, and I looked at him and said, well, if you're paying all that money in storage, why don't you pay the same amount of money in a storefront? store everything in there and have people walk in the front door and, and buy it and the conversation went downhill from there <laughs> and so and so we feel that uh, our our mission here at survival solutions is twofold number one is we want to research good quality products uh, for people and um, and the other is is we want to be a resource of information and so we have classes and seminars on a wide variety of topics and the classes started getting so popular that we instituted Prepper University, or PU, because it stinks to be unprepared. And so every time that people come to a class, they get PU credits. And uh, we've got some people who have earned their associate's degree, and we give them a little, a little uh, diploma. It's just kind of a thank you for putting up with us, and, and uh, just a, kind of a sign of our, our appreciation. And so... Um, that's kind of what we're about. I'll just give you a real quick tour of what we have. We've got grab-and-go kits, 72-hour kits, or all the components where you can customize your own. We've got a great line of food storage in the last 25 years, and you had an opportunity to taste a few of those. Uh, we've got the best water filtration system on the market. it will make any water, any source, uh, clean and safe to drink. Uh, Solar-powered flashlights, medical kits, things such as that. So uh, if we can uh, be a resource to help you prepare, because a lot of things that uh, you'll be talking about tonight, um, that's why we're here, to help people get prepared if in the event that uh, a natural disaster or hyperinflation or, you know, I know it's crazy talk, but, you know, the Middle East, something happened there, that would never happen. But anything like that uh, could have a ripple effect here, here in, in Boise, Idaho. And so that's why we're here in, in business and we would love to assist you. Our, our motto is we provide peace of mind for challenging times. And I sense that we have some of those challenging times uh, on the horizon. And uh, that might be a good lead in for, for you. All so, right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for uh, coming to our talk tonight. Uh, um, my subject is uh, economic issues for every citizen. And basically, uh, economics is too broad of a subject. That's something that we could talk about every night for a month. Um, and so what I want to concentrate on tonight is what are the most important economic issues that us as citizens need to know um, so that we can uh, realize what's coming up in the future. Uh, my name is Jim Breuer, and um, I guess I became interested in economics on a day in October in 1987 when I turned on the radio on the way home from, uh, from uh, work, and everybody was in a panic. There had been a huge crash on the, uh, on the stock exchange, the uh, biggest one since the Great Depression. It was Black Monday um, in October of 97. And so the next day, um, I went and bought a paper. We didn't have the internet back then, so we couldn't watch it in real time. Um, thank God. And I went and well, I looked at my one stock that I owned back then. It was the only thing I had, but it was a lot to me at the time. And I, I looked it up, found the column where it was, and, and, and found out that <coughs> in one day, I had lost 25% of all of my money. And immediately, the um, questions started flooding into my head. You know, how could this happen? Don't we have you know, government officials that keep this, these kinds of things from happening to us? Or wouldn't they warn us, etc., etc.? The answer was obviously no. And the answer today is no also. And so we need to uh, be aware of these issues ourselves. So I'm an engineer. I'm not an economist. And in some ways, that's a disadvantage to not have spent all of my time for the last 20 years doing nothing but studying economic issues and not having a, uh, you know, not being a professor of economics at Princeton or something like that. 
But in another way, I think that it's an advantage because as an outsider, it gives me an unbiased perspective. And I've done a lot of research into this subject. So uh, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, um, I offer is Exhibit A, Ben Bernanke. Now, he used to be the, uh, the chairman of the economics department at Princeton University. Um, ben Bernanke was, and, and now he is probably the most important uh, economic official in the Western world today. He's the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. And, um, but, so he's, he is the expert's expert on economics. So, but he, listen to this quote from Ben Bernanke in February 2006. Housing markets are cooling a bit. Our expectation is that the decline in activity or the slowing in activity will be moderate and that house prices will probably continue to rise. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure whenever somebody reminds him of that quote, this is, uh, this is what he, uh, uh, he does. And um, so the important to think, the thing to understand is that Ben Bernanke is the most powerful economic official in our country today, and yet he doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, and, you know, I, I've been thinking about this for many years, of why would that be? Um, and what I realized is that economics isn't all science. It's not a science like med medicine or physics or something like that, where you can just predict anything in the future. It's part science and part philosophy. And, and um, so being an engineer, the way I look at problems is I want to know what has been done and then what has the, have the results been. Those are the two important things to me. I don't care about um, you know, all of these crazy graphs and theories. Okay, that's fine, but I want to know what's been done and what have the result, results been. And then possibly a third thing, once we understand those two, what can we do to make it better? So part of economics is clearly scientific. So a very simple example would be if you're going to go uh, buy a house. You're going to um, find out how much you need to borrow. You're going to find out what the interest rate is going to be. You're going to um, you know, decide that you'll do this for 30 years and that uh, here's how much money I have to put down. And you turn the crank on the equation, and it, out the other end it spits out, you're going to pay this much per month. So there's parts of economics that are scientific, that are verifiable, um, that we can all um, independently verify. But the other part of economics is governed primarily not by science, but by philosophy. That, and it's in this part, I believe, is maybe even more important to understanding our situation today. And that's what we'll talk about in the following slides. So, here I've got, a, we'll, we'll talk about four economic uh, philosophers um, in a, as a prelude to this tonight. And um, so the first one that I wanted to talk about is Karl Marx. You know, everybody knows about him to some degree. He's the father of modern socialism. And, but he wrote extensively on economics. And he thinks the workers should control the means of production, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, but few people realize that Karl Marx wrote um, many, many works on economics. One was one of the most famous was Das Kapital, and he was a very active uh, economic theoretician. Um, so you see, you can think when you think about Karl Marx you can start to see that economics isn't just science, it's philosophy. He had, Karl Marx has a very different philosophy than the one that we all ascribe to. But I think it's important to look at Karl Marx when we talk about economic philosophy. And I think he can teach us two very important things. One is that economic philosophy can sometimes go beyond a philosophy and become an orthodoxy. So when something is an orthodoxy, if you talk about an orthodoxy in a religious point of view, 
this, these are the set of beliefs that we're all expected to believe. And um, if you don't believe this set, of, um, this set of tenets, you are an outsider, you're a heretic. So the same thing was true when Karl Marx, um, when his theories controlled half of the world's surface at one time, and it wasn't that long ago. Um, so that's the first thing we want to realize about Karl Marx is that that uh, economic philosophy can become an orthodoxy where we are all expected to accept it. Um, the second thing to uh, realize about Marx is that, that he can teach us is that ideas have consequences. That they're not just ideas, fluffy things that we all talk about. They have consequences. So he was directly responsible for plunging dozens of countries into an economic abyss of unimaginable proportions in the 20th century. He was also indirectly responsible for um, a, a trail of corpses. 150 million people died because of his ideas, possibly as many as 200 million. The estimates vary. And so you, you need to understand that economic ideas have power. Um, the second one here couldn't be more different than Karl Marx, Adam Smith. So let's look what Adam Smith has to say. He says, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. So this is the main tenet behind capitalism. And um, you might recognize uh, some of Adam Smith's ideas as being very much in line with the, the US Constitution when you read a lot of his writings. Um, and in fact, he was uh, around at the same time that the US Constitution was written. And um, so just think for a moment, two economic philosophers, and think of Adam Smith, um, he was an inspiration for the constitution of the most successful country ever to inhabit the face of planet Earth. And Karl Marx was just a trail of destruction. Two economic philosophies, very different, with very different results. So ideas have power. Um, the, the third of four economist that we'll look at is Ludwig von Mises. And um, he's from the Austrian school, and he's fairly representative of their ideas. But I, I look at the, the Austrian school as being almost an extension of Adam Smith's ideas. They're, very, they're in line with, with his ideas. And so let's look at what he thinks. So the expansion of free markets, the division of labor, and private capital investment is the only possible path to prosperity and flourishing of the human race. So he says that capitalism really is the right way to go. Um, socialism is disastrous because of the absence of private ownership of land and capital goods prevents any sort of rational pricing or estimates of costs. So what's very important to the Austrian economists is prices. Prices are signals. Prices signal producers what it is that the, the market needs more or less of. For instance, you might think of a commodity like wheat. So if uh, wheat prices keep inching up every year, a farmer goes, hey, you know, it might be to my advantage to plant some wheat next year. And in doing so, he, he creates more wheat out in the marketplace that's good for consumers. It's also good for himself. That is how capitalism works. So his third idea here is government intervention is counterproductive and cumulative, leading inevitably to socialism unless the entire tissue of interventions is repealed. So basically what he's saying is that um, on the one hand you have uh, private action, which is more like capitalism, and on the other side you have socialism, which is very centralized control. And he's warning that government intervention is counterproductive and moves the needle closer and closer and closer to socialism. We see that in our own society to some degree, where more and more government intervention happens and we get closer and closer to 
the ideal socialist um, uh, thinking. So the fourth out of the four that we're going to look at is the most important to us, Lord John Maynard Keynes. So the reason he's the most important is we talked about Marx used to be the economic orthodoxy over half of the Earth's surface. He was the economic orthodoxy in all of the communist world. But today, John Maynard Keynes is the economic orthodoxy in the Western world and in the United States. And so that's, that's what makes him so important. So let's look at his ideas. So he advocated the use of fiscal and monetary stimulus to mitigate the adverse effects of economic recessions and depressions. So you can recognize this when you turn on the news. He, whenever there's a, um, whenever the economy gets a little bit shaky, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to stimulate it somehow. We're supposed to come up with more money and shove it at the banks or shove it at this industry, that industry, whatever, and, um, and print it borrow it, it doesn't matter. We have to stimulate the demand. Um, Keynes is a proponent of stimulating demand. That's what he, that's his big thing. And um, <coughs> so anything we can do to stimulate demand will reduce unemployment and that is the important thing. Think of cash for clunkers. That's a good example.